it's not you, it's me. Every year you come around. And every year I hope that I'll have peace and joy and wonder. Every year I place my hope in the gifts you ask me to buy, but I still feel empty. Every year I chase after the seasonal traditions you bring, but I never catch up. Every year I organize my family gatherings that you encourage, but I still need to belong. They're all good things, I know, but they're not the best things. So maybe this is where I go back. Maybe this is where I go back to where it all really begins. It begins with a timeless story that happened in real time. It begins with a baby boy, born to a humble couple, announced by a proclamation from heavenly angels to lowly shepherds. It begins with a word that dwells among us and becomes the lamb that dies for us. You are God with us. You are God for us. And you are God refusing to abandon us. So Christmas, you're here, but I'm here too. Tired, but wide awake. Wide awake. To you. To this. To all of it. Because this. This is where Christmas begins. with you I bow before your throne I bear the deepest part of me to you and you alone I keep no secrets for there is no thought you have not known I bring my best and all the rest to you God didn't need help to bring his plan for our salvation to pass. 
Just as he had spoken stars into existence, Jesus could have simply appeared. But 1 Corinthians explains that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So in his wisdom, God chose a humble little Jewish girl to bring about the greatest miracle the world had ever known. Emmanuel would be knit together within her womb. The Creator would be created in human flesh and born as a baby. And as it always is with God's plans, He would do all the wonders it would take to make it happen if she would simply say, Yes, Lord, I'm willing. To me, according to your word, I give myself to thee, just a servant to you, Lord. Though I don't understand your purpose or your plan, still I say, Be it unto me. of the Lord came to Mary in the night and said you've been highly favored you will bear God a child though the questions must have filled her heart she received the angel's word be it unto me. Be it unto me, according to your word. I give myself to thee, just a servant to take leads to places yet unknown and the choices that I make leave me feeling so alone I will keep my confidence in him with a trusting heart I'll say Lord I am yours be it unto me
gives us here um, some of the reasons that we know that God cares. And in verse number 17, the first reason or way that we know God cares is through his presence. Here in this verse, we see the very presence of God. This is what he says. The Lord your God <clears throat> is with you. What a promise. What a statement. That word there, Lord, comes from the Hebrew word, Yahweh, And it comes from the root word of Jehovah. And what the word means is, he is the self-existent or eternal Lord. What he is saying here is our God depends on no one. Our God is a great God. And then he says he is your God, indicating the personal nature of God, how that he is our personal God. And then not only does he say, Lord, thy God, but that word there, God, is an interesting word as well. From the Hebrew text, it means Elohim, our supreme God, one who serves as magistrate over all. I have a friend who's a federal judge. They sit on that bench. They manage the selection of jurors. That person uh, rules on evidence that can be in or out. Uh, that person takes the verdict and issues the sentence. Uh, they're a powerful person in that courtroom. But the word here, God, Elohim, gives the idea that God is uh, judge over all. He is the supreme judge over everything. You know what that tells me? God does not depend upon the Democrats, and he doesn't depend upon the Republicans. It tells me that God doesn't depend upon the preachers or the pastors. It tells me that God does not depend upon the mega church or the small church. And the truth is, God does not depend upon you or me. He is the supreme God and magistrate over all, and he blesses us with his presence. We know that God cares for us because of his presence with us. Think about that. The supreme ruler of the universe is our companion day in and day out. He's a friend, the Bible says, that sticks closer than even a brother. Folks, listen, that ought to, that ought to make you rejoice tonight to know that our God is the supreme ruler over all things. It also tells me that he has it all under control. You and I may not see how the pieces come together, but I know this, God cares for us as evidenced by his very presence with us. To think you and I can get up in the morning and bow our heads and our hearts and our knees toward heaven, and we're able to talk to the person that rules it all. What a blessing. We know that he cares because of his very presence. But there's another thing that we see here. We see here in this text. We know that he cares because he's in the midst of it with us. Look there at verse number 17 again. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. In the midst of thee. Now think about that. The God who is supreme and self-existent. The eternal God over all is our companion watching out for our welfare. There was a guy, missionary to the New Hebrides Islands by the name of John Patton, and his story was shared in 1991 by Today in the Word. Patton shared a story about when he was there at the mission statement in the New Hebrides Islands that's called today Venuta, uh, V-A-N-U-A-T-U. Uh, he shared a story about one night he was at the mission station and he was surrounded by hostile natives. Those hostile natives were planning on burning down the mission station 
and killing Patton and his family. <clears throat> All night long, Patton and his wife and his family prayed for God's protection over them. And early the next morning after the sun rose, the hostile natives got on their horses and they rode away. They removed themselves from the mission station. About a year later, the chief of that tribe was converted, became a believer in the Lord. Patton had a chance to talk with the native leader. And he said, one night, y'all surrounded our mission station, and we thought you were going to burn us down and kill us. Why didn't you? The tribal leader says, well, because of all those men. There were hundreds of men that were stationed all around your mission station. They had shiny uh, uh, garments and they had raised swords and we were afraid to attack. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God is in control of it all? And even when we don't understand, when there are things that we can't see, God has his army and he's over it all. But not only does God care for us as evidence through his presence, there's a second thing that I want you to see in this text, and that's found there in verse 17 as well. He blesses us not only with his presence, but with his power. He said, what do you mean, Preacher Wayne? Well, it says there, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He is mighty. That, that word mighty comes from a Hebrew word, gibor, and it means mighty warrior, champion, strong, and valiant. The idea is this. He is chief. He's strong. He's powerful. Notice here in this text the might of our God. While I was serving as senior pastor of a church in this state, I had a, a full-time youth minister who was a weightlifter. He is from Easley, and, and oh, Brad owned eight Guinness Book records for weightlifting. He was a strong dude. I'd watch him pump those irons out there in the gym sometime. Man, he was strong. He owned eight Guinness Books records for weightlifting. When I was reading this text, I thought about that. The Word of God tells us that we serve a God who is powerful. He's mighty. The idea here is that he is chief. And not only is he mighty, but he saves. And that word there, saves, means to be saved, to be free, to deliver, to rescue, to get victory, to bring salvation. Listen, dear friend, I'm grateful that we serve a mighty God, and he's capable of making us safe. He is capable of setting us free. He delivers from sin and darkness. He's a God that rescues us from danger, and he is a God that grant, grants to us salvation when we call upon him. And Zephaniah said to the people, we serve a mighty God. He is a powerful God. And so we know that God cares for us because of his presence, but also as evidenced by his power. But notice there in verse 17 what else he says. It says, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will save and he will rejoice over thee with joy. And so we know that God cares because he <clears throat> takes great delight in his children. There's nothing like being a child of God. Because we are a child of God, we, access, we have access to the throne of God and the King of glory. 
Because we are a child of God, we enjoy coming to his house. The psalmist says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because we're a child of God, we can trust him. Because he's present, he's powerful. But also because he takes great delight in us. This verse, this phrase here is a picture of God with eyes wide open, with not only his eyes open, but a smile on his face, delighting in his children. As a parent, have you ever stood back and just delighted in the work or the actions of his children? That's the picture that Zephaniah is pointing to here and picturing for us. He rejoices, and that means he's glad to be bright and cheerful, to take great delight. It thrills the heart of God to save one of his children, and then it delights the heart of God to watch his children and the state of that child. And that's what Zephaniah is saying here. He delights in us. Now, it reminds me of Luke 15 and verse number 10. And in Luke 15, 10, the Bible says that even the angels of heaven rejoice over one sinner that comes to repentance. The picture there is there's great delight in salvation and there's great delight in God's heart watching us serve for him. Tonight I'm reminded that God loves us and takes great delight over us and through us and with us as we serve him. But there's a fourth thing here I want you to see in this text regarding the fact that God cares, evidenced by his presence, evidenced by his power, evidenced through the delight that he takes over us. But it says there in verse number 17, he will rest in his love. Now that word rest is an interesting word. It, it liberally means a fabricator of material, a craftsman, a workman. The picture here, the idea is that God puts us together with his love. He builds our life and our day with his love. He builds our ministry with his love. He builds our fellowship with his love. He puts us together and builds us and makes us who we are through his love. I love that old song where you sing, God's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. You see, God is the fabricator of materials in our life that make us what we ought to be for him. And we can rejoice knowing that God loves us. Folks, there's nothing like the love of God. It's wide and it's deep. It's rich and it's wonderful. I'm reminded tonight that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more and there's nothing you can make to make God love you less. God simply loves you and he's putting us together. He's building us. He's resting in us with his love. Man, that will make a Baptist shout tonight to know that God loves us just the way we are. But there's one last thing I want you to see in this text tonight regarding the fact that God cares for us. And he cares for us as evidenced through his singing. Look there, don't miss this verse. Verse number 17 says this. He will joy over thee with singing. Singing. As I was studying this text, I never noticed this, but the fact that the, 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 one of the few times in Scripture that God is pictured here singing. But it makes sense to me that he would because the Bible speaks so often about the joy and the singing of heaven. And folks think if, if God has brought singing into heaven, evidently he's going to be a participator with us in that thing. 
And man, just think that God is rejoicing over us, and he says there, he will joy over thee with singing. The, the word singing comes from a Hebrew word, rinyal, and it literally means to shout a shout of joy, a proclamation of gladness by singing with triumph. Think about this. When we get to heaven, we're going to sing and rejoice around the throne of God. And the Bible says that God is already singing for joy over the work and the salvation of his people. I'm grateful for the fact that I'm a child of the king. And I know that I know that he cares for me. And he cares for you. And it's evidence here through his presence, through his power, through his delight over us, through his singing. Folks, I, I'm grateful for tonight that God cares. There was a story about a soldier who was very close to his dad. I mean, they were just really, really close. The mother had died, and the dad and the son just were very, very close friends. And one day, the son got a letter from the military saying that he had been drafted <clears throat> and he must report for duty. And it saddened and broke the dad's heart that his son was going to go away and fight in combat. And sure enough, he did. And, and one day there was a knock at the dad's door and um, there was a soldier, former soldier at the door and he said, I wanted to come and give you something. He said, your son was my best friend in battle and in combat. As a matter of fact, I was holding your son in my arms when he was wounded and killed. And the dad was there, just broke. He said, but here's what I did. When we were in combat together, I drew a picture of your son. And it was a rough, bad picture, but it was evident that it was a picture of the man's son. The man was very wealthy. He had a lot of drawings and pictures on the wall. He had uh, Van Gogh, and he had a Picasso, and he was very wealthy, and, and the man gave, the soldier gave him the picture that he had drawn of his son. He had that picture framed. He had the Van Goghs and the Picasso taken down. And there where they were, he put that picture of his son. <clears throat> Finally, the old man grew old and he died. And he left word that there was to be an auction of the, the estate. People came from far and wide to bid on the, the artwork that the man owned. And the instruction said, the first thing that you need to do is auction off the picture that was drawn of my son in battle. And they started the auction and the auctioneer said, we're going to auction this picture first. No one would bid on it, not a soul. Finally, the old gardener that had taken care of the estate said, I knew that boy. And when he grew up here, he said, <clears throat> I'd like to, I, I don't have much, but can I bid a dollar on it? They said, yes. And the dollar was taken as a bid for the picture of the man's son in combat. And after he came and gave them the dollar and picked up the drawing and started out the door, the auctioneer slammed the gavel and said, the auction is over. And they said, what do you mean? We want to bid on the good stuff. And he says, well, per the instruction of the owner, whoever gets the sun gets it all. The old gardener got the whole state because he was interested in the sun. You know where I'm going with this story. Folks, God cares. He delights in us. He's mighty to save. And when you and I have his son, we have it all. We have all that we need and all we could want because we have the son that was sent 
to die. When you have the Son, you have it all. And you have it all because God cares for you. We're going to have a hymn of invitation tonight. And that invitation is going to be the song out of the hymnal, Does Jesus Care? And of course, as we listen to the song, we know that he does. Maybe you want to bow your heart right where you are and thank God for his presence, for his power. Thank God that he delights in you. Thank God that he cares so much that he even sings and rejoices over the salvation. Of his people. For God bless you and Just know this. God cares. As the bird and spreads and the cares distress and the waves. 